Hi everyone, my name is Bingbing. I'm a software engineer in Meta. I'm focusing on start the system right now. And I'm here today with Kuma, who will join me later to share the journey of building Delta, which is a chain replication block start the system with all of you. And as you see here, my cat is also a fan for Delta. So she will join me with the presentation today too. And in this presentation, we will talk about what is Delta and why it was introduced what a typical request workflow looks like in our system, and what improvements we have done so far. And we are doing this presentation in the hope of inspiration for people who are curious about like building a Delta a data storage system from zero scratch. Or if you are already familiar with some of the data storage system, you can easily compare them with our chain replication based storage system. Based on that, I believe our real product experiences of implementing a storage system could also be helpful in some way. Okay, let's talk about what is Delta first. Delta is a chain replication based, highly reliable, scalable, and low dependency blob storage. At the same time, Delta is also the first implementation of chain replication inside Meta. Before diving deep into the Delta technical details, I'm also going to walk you through a little bit why Delta was introduced at the very beginning. Delta was introduced to replace storage service cluster inside meta infrastructure. As the, as the name suggests, the service was based on the Red Hat open source project. It was introduced in the year of 2012. After running for six years, we started to see a lot of scaling problems, especially when the total data size reaches to exabyte level. Since cluster was not designed to run at petabyte scale, let alone exabyte, it took significant effort to run Glasser at this scale. Then the plan to migrate from Glasser started at the year of 2019. At the same time, Delta project was proposed to support some of the Glasser use cases from the migration. And one of the most important one is Meta's build system. Delta became alive in the first region at the end of 2020. Since then, we have been serving as a storage system for meta build and distribution system. The service has also evolved and then started to support a few more use cases since then. Okay, now you know why Delta was introduced. You might also be wondering, why did we choose chain replication to build the data, a Delta instead of the broadly used quorum-based replication? Okay, let's take a look at the quorum-based replication system first. In a typical quorum-based storage system, there are usually several replicas for each blob. One of them is primary, and the others are the secondaries, as the diagram we see here. Client usually first sends a write request to the primary node. After the primary node has processed the data and succeeds the write request, it will try to forward all the write requests to all the secondary nodes in parallel. In most of the system, as soon as a primary node sees the majority of the secondary node persists the data successfully, the client is told, okay, your write request has been succeeded. However, the client could also try to read the newly created object from a replica that has not yet persisted the data. For example, the last gray node in our diagram. This kind of data storage system usually doesn't guarantee strong consistency of, among all replicas while most of Delta's use cases would prefer to have strong consistency. Another, uh, another reason that we didn't choose quorum-based replication system is because it's not simple enough. Electing a primary node and changing the cluster state are the two fundamental tasks that all nodes must work together to perform robustly. The prime node takes more responsibility and is more important than the other secondary nodes when the primary node becomes unavailable, one of the secondary nodes needs to be elected and then promoted as a new primary node, as, as the diagram shows here. And you also need to catch up from the previous in-sync state. Compared to this a little complicated failure recovery, Delta's story is much, much simpler and I'll cover it in a following session. Now I have described what is Delta and why it was introduced. I'll pass over to Kuma who will join me and he will describe the basis of chain replication 
and how Delta leveraged it to become a reliable storage service. Thanks, Binbin. Before I resume from where Binbin left, I would like to quickly introduce myself. I'm Kumar. I've been at Meta for a couple of years now. Throughout my tenure at Meta, I've been with the Delta team. I'm super excited to share some of the cool things that we've been working on over the past couple of years. All right. Now that we have refreshed our understanding with how quorum based replication systems work, let's try to understand how chain replication works. That's important because Delta is based on this research paper. It's called chain replication for supporting high throughput and availability. Chain replication is a different approach to coordinating clusters of storage servers. In chain replication, all replicas in a replica set are chained together, like the linked list of nodes as shown in this diagram. The first node of a chain is referred to as the head and the last node is referred to as the tail of the chain. Let's talk about how writes work in chain replication. All client writes are directed to the head of the chain. The head processes the write, essentially storing it on its local media and forwards the update to the next node in the chain. The second node does the same and forwards the update further down the chain. The request completes only after the tail has persisted the data successfully. That means that if a client receives a success for writing a particular object, then that object is guaranteed to be present on all links in the chain. This is in contrast to quorum based replication systems, where writes were acknowledged after majority servers had committed the write. Let's talk about reads now. In the initial implementation, all reads are processed by the tail of the chain. Since a write request is only marked successful when all links in the chain have processed it, this guarantees that any objects read from the tail are already present on all links in the chain. This way, we ensure strongly consistent reads. Again, this is in contrast to how reads work in quorum based application systems, where reads could be eventually consistent, as described by Binbin in a previous slide. It must be pretty clear at this point that the tail would become a hotspot as it's the only node serving all the reads while also serving writes. We'll get back to this and talk about how we can optimize the reads at a later stage in the presentation. With the basics of chain replication out of the way, let's talk about how everything comes to life. This is what a Delta bucket looks like. A Delta bucket is a client specific cluster of servers that store data for a particular customer. A bucket includes lots of chains. Each chain itself is a replica set, which usually has four or more servers across different failure domains to guarantee the durability and availability in the event of servers in a particular failure domain being impacted. Each chain serves a slice of data and traffic, essentially behaving like a logical shard. As far as scalability goes, we can just add more hosts into a cluster or add more chains. As of now, we add more servers and rebalance data across these newly added servers. We haven't implemented scalability via adding more chains at this point, but it can definitely be done if required. As described earlier, all client writes are directed to the head of a chain, while all reads are served by the tail of a chain. This configuration of all hosts and chains in a particular Delta bucket is stored in a metadata storage service. This metadata storage service is built on top of Zookeeper. Clients depend on this bucket config to determine the hosts to send requests to, head in case of writes and tail in case of reads. Delta is primarily focused towards serving critical package workloads and other low dependency use cases. As such, we have made conscious efforts to keep the service as low dependency as possible. Delta's only dependency is this bucket config store and we have employed appropriate failover measures in case this metal storage service is unavailable. Now that I've described the basics of chain replication and how Delta leverages it to become a reliable storage service, I'll pass it over to Binbin Bin to talk about how a service has evolved over a period of time. Thanks Kuma for introducing what is Delta and how does chain replication get implement implemented in our system for version one. After initial v1 implementation of Delta storage, we have also continuously improved the service from different aspects. I'm going to describe how we improved the story for failure detection and recovery 
and how we optimize the replication protocol for better performance. And Kuma then will introduce our cross-region replication and disaster recovery stories. The first Delta evolution was failure detection and recovery. Delta is a stateful service with a unique cluster layout. We can't simply use any Meta's in-house service or tools to maintain the fleet, so we need to implement the failure detection and recovery ourselves. For failure detection, we apply some voting logic, where a host gets disabled if several peers voting to be unhealthy. Check the diagram as an example. Link 3 in the chain is now not reachable by link 2 and link 4. Both the upstream and downstream vote link 3 to be unhealthy. Then link 3 get disabled and removed from the chain. Of course, there are several decisions that we need to make here and what kind of like a trade-off that we need to think about. One of them is how long the timeout for link 2 and link 4 should wait until marking link 3 to be unhealthy. We can't trust the server's network to be stable all the time, since there are always transient network issues, or we can't set this timeout to be too short, but it can't be too long either. Otherwise, it will impact the operation latency, and Delta's client would also time out waiting for a response. From our production exercise, we have set this value to be under a minute. Another decision that we need to make here is, what's the limit of peers voting for an unhealthy link before it should be disabled. The limit definitely can't be one, since it's possible for two hosts voting each other to be unhealthy, and both of them get disabled from the chain. The limit can't be too large either. Otherwise, the unhealthy host will stay in the fleet for a longer time and impact the overall latency and performance. For most of the links in our system, upstream and downstream are guaranteed to have frequent connections. So two was a relatively good number for us. After link three get removed from uh, in the previous scenario, there now only have three links in a chain, which means that we only have three replicas per block, which is not an ideal status because we always want four replicas instead of three. Let's take a look at how the chain will be recovered, and then we can bring one more replica for this block in the chain. To recover the chain, we also created a separate fleet management service named Ringmaster. It's an automated control plan with primary focus around repairing Delta buckets. Each Ringmaster instance is configured to monitor a Delta bucket. When any chain in the bucket is missing a link, just like our chain here, Ringmaster attempts to repair it and then enable a host to the tail, which becomes the new tail. This newly added host could be the original Link 3 host after fixing, for, for example, some hardware issue or network issue. Or it could be a totally new host, but we usually prefer to fix a chain with original Link 3 host, since the physical host still have most of the blobs and it could save the time to sync up blobs from its original upstream. I also want to point out that we have done some innovative stuff here. For example, the original chain replication paper puts both duties of failure detection and failure recovery on an external service, while in Delta, we, you, uh, we let the chains detect the failures for peers themselves and then get repaired externally, which is a ringmaster service. Another improvement we have done is try to optimize the chain replication protocol, aiming for better performance. As Kuma has mentioned in a previous slide, you may also notice in order to guarantee strong consistency, all the read requests were going to the tail of the chain. Obviously, the read throughput is limited by the network bandwidth of a single host. This is definitely not ideal status. So the limited host was a tail of the chain. And this definitely is not efficient. You might already able to guess how we can improve it. Uh, improve it. Yes. We can always distribute that. We try to improve the read latency via apportioned queries, which is also based on a paper, by the way. The read requests now have been spread across all links in the chain. In this way, we were able to increase more than 50% of read capacity in our system, which is a dramatic increase. Wow, I really want to celebrate this for a second here. 
Okay, now the celebration is done. Uh, theoretically, our read speed could uh, be improved four times faster, but we can't achieve this in reality because the read super increase doesn't come for free after distribution. So in order to keep the strong consistent nature of delta, the link need to query from tail of the chain first to verify the blob existence before returning the blob content to the client. Now I have included Delta's failure detection and recovery, as well as protocol improvement. I'll pass over to Kuma to talk about other Delta ev evolutions. Thanks again, Binbin. Carrying on with other features introduced as part of Delta's evolution, I would like to talk about cross-region replication. Cross-region replication pertains to providing facilities for distributing and retrieving data across different locations according to customers' needs without expecting any engagement from the clients. In the V1 implementation of the service, when Delta clients wanted to store a blob in multiple regions due to data safety considerations, they were making a request to each of the regions. This is clearly not ideal from a customer point of view. Delta's customers shouldn't be in the business of tracking object locations while being able to control the level of redundancy and geo-distribution preferences. A client app should be able to just put an object to the store and expect the underlying service fabric to propagate the change everywhere. The same goes for retrievals. In the steady state, the clients can expect to just get an object by submitting a request and letting the service figure out as to what's the most optimal source available at the moment. As the service evolved, we introduced global replication to multiple client regions. This was done in a hybrid fashion. A combination of synchronously replicating blobs to a few minimum set of regions and asynchronously replicating blobs to the remaining set of regions. In the event of a particular region experiencing a network partition or an outage, the system would be intelligent enough to exclude that region from participating in geo replication until it comes back. Then that region could be asynchronously backfilled with the customer blobs that it doesn't have. Moving on, let's talk about disaster recovery. Regardless of how carefully you design and build a system, outages can and do happen. As mentioned earlier, one of the key tenets for Delta is to be as low dependency as possible. Alongside having minimal dependencies, we have also invested in having a reliable disaster recovery story. If you think about Delta's positioning in Meta's infra stack, it's at the very bottom providing the basic primitive that is required for the rest of the infrastructure to be available and recoverable. This makes us a particularly viable storage service option for use cases that care about disaster preparedness and recovery. As of now, we have integrated with archival services to continuously backup customer blobs to cold storage and Darkstorm. Darkstorm is a bootstrap environment which is available even when all of Meta's infrastructure is down. Additionally, we have developed the ability to continuously restore objects from both cold storage and dark storage. Out-of-box integration with archival services provide us with reliable recoverability guarantees in severely degraded environments. We have a bunch of partner teams who have integrated with our service because of our disaster recovery guarantees. Well, that's all we have for today's presentation. But before I let you go, I do want to talk about what's in the pipeline and what lies ahead. We are working on a centralized backup and restore service for all core infrastructural services within Meta. Any reliable stateful service must be able to produce a snapshot of its internal state, essentially backups, and rehydrate the internal state from a snapshot, the restore flow. Our goal is to position ourselves as a gateway to all archival services and provide a centralized backup offering to our customers. Additionally, we want to serve as a reliable recovery provider by providing our customers with a seamless recovery path for these backups. This includes recovering from scenarios like isolated failures, regional outages, global outage, data wipeout, and much more. These are the first couple of major investments for this year and many more such efforts lie ahead in our future roadmap. That's it from us. Thank you all for your time. I hope you have a nice session today.